Well, hello, folks. We're uh, back again on a Thursday evening, early evening, late afternoon, uh, with Ken David Stewart. And what I'd like to do today is continue with uh, my great literary epic, Roswell 1947, or as it's become known to some today, the play that wouldn't die. Now, yesterday I added a bit to the, you know, from where we left off in September when I abandoned this play. I didn't think there was any uh, more interest in it, but obviously there was. So I decided to continue it because I had, uh, you know, a backlog of, of more uh, episodes and scenes and acts and all that stuff written. Uh, yesterday provided a synopsis, too, of as much of the plot as I could remember, because this plot takes an incredible amount of twists and turns. And I might say it's either the type of play you're going to love or you're going to hate. Uh, you know, it'll probably depend on what kind of sense of humor you have. Uh, but it definitely is meant to take you out of your present zone and into the science fiction realm of Roswell in 1947, the year of the great UFO crash. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do, because a lot missed out on it, is I'm going to start right from the opening acts of the play. Act 1, Scene 1. As our play opens, a group of old men are sitting in rocking chairs outside the Roswell General Store. It's getting late in the evening and the temperature is dropping rapidly. The men are suddenly startled by an unusual sight in the sky. Dewey said, What the heck is that? Look up to the sky. Buford says, I don't know. Looks like a silver disc with bright flashing lights. Clem, well, I'll tell you, it's losing elevation like real fast. Dewey, I can't see it anymore. It's disappeared behind yonder hill. Narrator, in a few seconds, the men heard a loud crash that sounded like thunder. The crash seemed to have come from behind the hill. As they heard the sound, the sky lit up like a huge orange-yellow flame. Act 1, Scene 2. We are now at the ranch of Mick Russell. His ranch is not far from the city of Roswell. It is 5 a.m. and Mick is suddenly stirred from a sound sleep by noise created by his animals. Mick says, Those damn animals! It's too early for them to be up. I better go out and check what the commotion's all about. Mick sleepily puts on his jeans and t-shirt and walks down the hall towards his son's bedroom. Mick says, Rob, get up. The animals are all freaked out about something. Rob says, Ah, oh, come on, Dad. I was up until three in the morning partying. Mick says, That's tough. Put on your clothes and come help your dad. Rob says, all right, I'm coming. Don't get your shirt in a knot. As soon as Mick and Rob walk about 100 yards into the field, they found out what rattled the animals. Act 1, Scene 2. Mick says, What the heck? Look at all those tiny, shiny pieces of metal. Rob says, Yeah, there must be hundreds of jagged pieces. The glare off the sun is almost blinding. Mick. Where do you think all this metal came from, son? Rob says, I'll tell you, Dad, it looks like something very large crashed here last night. Mick, it's that damn Air Force base. They're always testing some top secret stuff over there. Narrator, Rob picks up a few of the metal pieces and starts to examine them. Rob, this stuff is weird, Dad. It's giving me the creeps. It's so flexible, it's unreal. Look, Dad, I can roll up a piece of the metal uh, up into a ball and it straightens itself right out again. Derrider. Mick moves closer to Rob to take a closer look. Mick. 
Look at that strange marking on this piece. Rob, it looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics or something. Mick says, you're talking way over my head, son. I only went up to grade eight. Don't worry, though. Let's put some of this stuff in a bag. I'll take it to the sheriff tomorrow and see what he makes of it. Then I'm going to ask him, who's going to clean up this mess on my ranch? Rob, I forgot to tell you, Dad. Last night we were sitting outside White's place drinking beer when we saw this amazing flash of bright orange light in the sky. Then kaboom, we heard this deafening crash. Mick, what you guys probably heard and saw was the light show from the Pink Floyd concert. They were playing in Albuquerque last night. Rob, Dad. This is 1947. Rock and roll hasn't even been invented yet. Mick. Oh, yeah, you're right. Mick climbs into his old rusted pickup truck and heads for town. While he's driving, Rob turns on the radio. They start listening to the Rick Black Morning Show. Roswell 1947, Act 1, Scene 2, as our video podcast continues. Rick Black, the DJ. Good morning, Roswell. I just got a call from Buford, one of the old guys we always see outside the general store. They said something about seeing some bright lights in the sky last night. Dewey said something about a loud crash or something behind a hill. Dwight Miller, Rick's co-host. Well, Rick, we all know how these good old boys like to sit around and and tell each other stories. Let's face it, they don't have much else to do to pass the time. I mean, how many Carter's little liver pills can you take in one day? <laughs> Rick, right. And how many times can you rub Bengay on your old decrepit aching joints? But all the same, Buford sounded awful scared on the phone. Dwight, yeah. And let's not forget that secret Air Force base way out in the desert. Rick, Area 51, you mean? Yeah, I've been hearing all kinds of rumors about weird experiments that they do down there. Okay, Act 1, Scene 3. The pink part. After approximately a half an hour's ride, Mick Russell arrives at the sheriff's office in the town of Roswell. He walks in and asks if he can speak to Sheriff Elmer Pyle. Sheriff Pyle says, Howdy, Mick. What you got in the bag there? Mick says, That's the thing. I don't know. That's why I'm bringing it to you. All I know is that my ranch is all covered in this stuff. Mick empties the bag on the sheriff's desk. Sheriff Pyle, Wow! You weren't kidding, Mick. This stuff is weird. It looks and feels mighty creepy to me. The phone on the sheriff's desk rings loudly. Clem. Elma! It's Clem! Me and the boys saw a bright object shaped sort of like a triangle. It disappeared from my sight and crashed somewhere beyond the hills. Sheriff Pyle. Thanks for the information, Clem. It may be a coincidence, or it may have some connection to what I'm looking at right now. I'm going to call Colonel Marshall at the Air Force Base right now. This might be something he needs to know about. The sheriff hangs up the phone and then immediately phones the Air Force Base. Act 1, Scene 3. Let's see if I can find it. Oh. Just have a little bit of a technical problem. Where some papers got misplaced. Oh, I think we're back on. No, we're not. Something uh, screwed up here. Holy crow, because one of the pages is repeating itself over and over again. Oh, here we go. Finally, we're on the right track. Sorry, folks. Sheriff Pyle. Colonel Marshall, this is Sheriff Pyle. Sir, I have some strange metallic material on my desk that you might be interested in. A local rancher just brought a bag of this stuff in today. 
He reported that a lot more of this stuff is scattered all over his ranch. I also got a phone call about a possible aircraft crash last night, and I was wondering if there could be any connection between the two incidents. Colonel Marshall. That's interesting, Sheriff. I'm just checking last night's logbook, but there doesn't appear to be any mention of a possible, possible crashed aircraft. However, a night shift officer told me that he got a few phone calls about seeing some strange lights in the sky last night. I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to send our crashed aircraft specialist, Major Jesse Ventura, out to have a look at this guy's ranch. There's a cold war going on, and I want to know if the Soviets are flying the aircraft over our base to spy on us. Thank you very much for the heads up, Sheriff Powell. Act 2, Scene 2. About 30 miles northwest of Corona, New Mexico, an archaeology professor and four of his students are out in the desert looking for dinosaur bones. Michael, one of the students, says, Professor! Some harsh reflecting light is right in my eyes. Professor Stone. It's probably coming from that silver object embedded in the hill just about 50 yards yonder. Robert. Can we go see what it is, sir? Professor Stone. Of course. Looks like some type of aircraft that's crashed. We need to check if any passengers are injured. The professor and his young charges jog out to the hill. Chris, the student, says, Wow, what a weird looking aircraft. It's shaped like a triangle. Howard, another student, This is getting too creepy for me, man. Let's get out of here. Fest Stone, Not until we check for injured passengers, Howie. If you ever want to make us an archaeologist, you can't keep on whipping out just like that. Howard. Sorry, sir. Forgot all about my civic duty. Professor Stone. It's okay, son. We all have our weak moments. Michael, the student. Over here, guys. Check out what's on the other side of this craft. Chris. I don't believe it. There's two little men in silver suits just outside the craft. Professor Stone. I'm not so sure they're human. Look at the unusually large head and tiny bodies. Howard. Whatever they are, they're not doing too good right now. I can't get a pulse on either one of these guys. Michael. We probably can't help those two, but let's see if there's anyone still inside the craft. Robert Price opened the door of the cockpit with a crowbar. When he looks inside, he sees two little creatures slumped in their seats. Chris gives one of the strange creatures in the silver suit a shake. Chris, this little guy is as dead as the two outside the spacecraft. Howie, not this one though. His arm is a trembling. Robert, Howie's right. He's still alive, but he's struggling to breathe. Narrator, it isn't long before a fire truck and an ambulance arrive from just behind the hill. A firefighter and a paramedic get out of their vehicles. Okay, we're going to hold it uh, right there, folks, and see what to wait for the next episode to what happens next time. Okay, we'll see you soon.